The House Tax Policy Committee will come to order. We will hear from my clerk, from a letter from Speaker Tate. Mr. Clerk, I'm making following changes to the Tax Policy Committee for the 102nd Legislature. Representative Andrew Fink will be removed from tax policy. Representative Mike Hoadley will be added to tax policy. Sincerely, Joe Tate, Speaker of the House. Thank you. Now our clerk would take attendance. Chair Neely? Here. Representatives Farhat? Here. Brixie? Here. Carter? Here. Litsett? Here. Grant? Here. Price? Here. Van Workham? Here. Markinen? Altman? Here. Tisdell? Here. Hoadley? Here. Madam Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you, Clerk. Now we will uh, have Vice Chair Van Workham make a motion to adopt the minutes from the March 1st, 2023 meetings. Without any objections, the, meetings, the minutes are adopted. For today, we will have um, on our agenda the presentation of Tax Structure in History with Jeff Guilford, who's the Chief um, Deputy Treasurer. Could you please come up? Okay, thank you for, for being here today. We are all excited to hear what you have to say to us. Madam Chair, members of the committee, thanks for having me today. It's always great to have people excited to hear a presentation on taxes. So I'm excited to, I'm excited to present to you today. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to just do a very brief overview of the department. I have a bunch of slides in here I'm not going to go through, but I put them in there for your reference. But just to note that the Michigan Department of Treasury does a lot of stuff besides taxes. So we do do the taxes. We administer and collect more than $34 billion in taxes and fees. Um, but we also do the economic and revenue forecasting. Um, we do state and local tax policy and um, some oversight. Uh, we oversee the investments of state funds, including common cash, the trust funds, um, the state employee retirement fund, and the retirement fund for public school employees. Uh, we're responsible for higher education student financial assistance and savings plans like uh, the Michigan Education Trust. Um, we manage the state's balance sheet. Um, and then with taxes, we process more than 8 million tax returns a year, and we manage uh, unclaimed property for the state. So if uh, you should check our website, we may owe you money that we can give you. And we returned $135 million to taxpayers last year. Uh, I won't go through our mission and value and, and all of that detail, but I just wanted to note um, some of our pillars that we base our work on. Um, employee engagement, we try to have a really uh, highly professional and dedicated team so that we can provide the best service uh, to our customers. We have a real focus on customer service and continuous improvement. We've become a really metrics-oriented organization so that we can make sure that as we process those millions of tax returns, um, the taxpayers get a really good experience. So I'll skip these. Um, a note on tax administration. So we annually receive about 8 million tax returns a year. Most of those are systematically processed um, without humans touching them. They go through the computer system, they get scanned in, and they process. But a small percentage of them do need uh, manual review. About 5.5 million of those are individual income tax returns. Uh, we answer about 198,000 calls last year with an average speed to answer of uh, 2 minutes and 30 seconds. And if you tried to call the IRS last year, you'll know that that is much, much faster than the IRS. Um, we had 75,000 pieces of correspondence that we answered. Um, and we generally get your income tax refund to you in seven to 10 days. So we have a really, we really high speed on that. Um, we pride ourselves on that. Similar statistics for the business taxes of sales use and withholding. We have three million returns. Uh, we answer a lot of phone calls, handle a lot of correspondence. I've got, I'm not going to go through this slide, but this has some of our metrics on it. We do track these metrics closely. If we see a metric is sliding, then we, we do a deep dive to figure out uh, what's going on. And I'll note, too, we do process millions of tax returns, but you know, if you have half a percent of those have some kind of issue, then people can get caught up. It's a decent amount of people. Um, if you have constituents that have issues on the tax front, please let us know, and we can assist with that. We have a taxpayer advocate. Uh, group, and that's what they do is resolve issues for taxpayers that are struggling to work with the department. Okay, turning on to Michigan's tax structure. Uh, this first slide I just put in here, it's slightly older data, but just to give perspective on the level of taxes that people pay at the various levels. So um, at the federal level, clearly is the most taxes that Michigan taxpayers pay. You pay about two and a half times as much to the federal government as to the state government. And then taxpayers pay about twice as much to the state government as they do to local government. So the federal government really is the big source of tax payments for most Michiganders and, and businesses. Um, but state and local taxes are clearly important. 
Um, with slightly more recent data, state and local taxes generated about $50 billion last year, so a pretty significant number. And I think it's worth noting that just three taxes accounted for 80% of that revenue. So the big three taxes are the income tax, um, the sales tax, and the property tax. And so that, that's where the vast majority of the money comes from. We obviously have a number of other taxes, including the corporate income tax, um, the remnants of the Michigan business tax, our transportation taxes, the tobacco tax, and a handful of other taxes. And I'm going to go through those in more detail in the coming slides. If you look at um, taxes paid to state government, the big two for state government are the income tax and the sales and use tax. Those represent about two-thirds of the taxes that the state gets, just with those two taxes. Um, the corporate income tax only generates about 3% of taxes. Um, the SET, which is a, a six mil statewide property tax, the state education tax generates about 7%, um, tobacco about 3%, gasoline and diesel generate about 4%, and motor vehicle registration fees, which also go to roads, another 4%, so about 8% of the tax total is transportation related. Um, we have the quality assurance assessment. We actually don't administer that tax. That's a Medicaid uh, bed tax. And then um, all of the variety of other taxes total about 8% of Michigan taxes. So I'm going to go through the taxes uh, individually in a bit more detail. I have a place at the end for questions, but obviously if you have questions as I go, feel free to, feel free to stop, stop me at any time. So the state individual income tax is the state's largest tax. Uh, it's, gen it's estimated to generate about $13.5 billion this year. Um, the vast majority of that, $9 billion, is going to the general fund. And the income tax is the most important funding source to the state's general fund. Um, there's also an important piece that goes to the school aid fund and about $600 million that goes to transportation funds. Our income tax piggybacks off the federal tax, so we start our tax base with federal adjusted gross income. And what this means, it, it, it is simpler to administer that way, but it also means that changes in federal law can have an impact on Michigan's income tax. So they can make changes that will raise the amount of income taxes we uh, generate, and they can make changes that reduce the amount of income taxes that we do if they change what's in federal uh, adjusted gross income. Uh, the current tax rate is 4.25%. Historically, that has ranged from a high of 6.35% um, to a low of 3.9%. We do have a couple of important credits on there. We have the property tax credit, which if your property taxes exceed a certain portion of your um, income, you can get. Uh, home heating credit, which uh, helps um, low-income Michiganders with their heating bills. Um, and the earned income tax credit or working families tax credit, which obviously has been in the news um, quite a bit lately. Our constitution does prohibit a progressive income tax, meaning progressive income tax would be the rates get higher as your income gets higher. Uh, there are 41 states with an income tax. 32 of them have progressive rates, although I'll note that a number of states with progressive rates, you hit the top rate at a very low income level, maybe $8,000 or $10,000, and so essentially those, those are flat taxes. There are a handful of states where you don't hit the top marginal rate until you have a very high income, a million dollars or $5 million, with, with uh, high marginal rates. Um, we also have a city income tax, so cities can levy an income tax. Um, 24 cities currently levy an income tax. We have over 200 cities, so most of them don't uh, levy an income tax. Um, residents pay the tax. Non-residents that work within the city also pay the city income tax, and they pay that uh, at half the rate that residents pay. Um, the sales tax is our second biggest tax. Uh, it's estimated to raise $10.8 billion for fiscal year 23. It's the most important funding source for the school aid fund. So um, you'll see that if you look at school aid fund estimates. Um, it's also an important funding source for revenue sharing. Both constitutional revenue sharing and statutory revenue sharing are paid out of the sales tax. Um, CTF is the Comprehensive Transportation Fund that uh, funds public transit, and then there's a piece that goes to the general fund as well. Uh, the current sales tax rate is 6%. That is the constitutional maximum. Um, the Constitution used to have a maximum of 4%, and we raised that by 2% in 1994 with Proposal A. So the sales tax base is the sale of tangible personal property. So when you sell property on the sales price, it's 6%. Um, the Constitution exempts food and prescription drugs. Uh, the Constitution does earmark most of the sales tax, so it's, it, the, the flexibility of this tax is relatively limited. Uh, almost three quarters goes to the school aid fund constitutionally, and then 10% goes to cities, villages, and townships constitutionally. 
Um, the companion to the sales tax is the use tax, and the use tax can be a little confusing. Um, it works hand in hand with the sales tax. So the sales tax is a tax on the sale of tangible personal property, and the use tax tends to be a tax on the use of tangible personal property that you didn't pay sales tax on. So for example, if you purchase a car, you pay sales tax, and if you lease the car, you pay you pay use tax. Um, the use tax is estimated to raise about $2.5 billion for fiscal year 23. Um, a little less than half of that goes to the general fund, a significant portion to the school aid fund. And then this is also the tax that we use to reimburse local governments um, for the personal property tax manufacturing and small business exemptions. And I'll talk about those uh, more a little later. The use tax is also the tax we levy on services that are taxed. Now, I'll note that Michigan does tax very few services. So Federation of Tax Administrators keeps a list of services taxed by the various states. Um, they put Michigan at 27 service, services taxed, whereas the median state taxes about 60 services. So we, we do tax very few services. Um, you'll hear us talk about the Streamlined Sales Tax Agreement a lot. Michigan is a member of the Streamlined Sales Tax Agreement along with 23 other states. The goal of the Streamlined Sales Tax Agreement is to make it easier um, for businesses to comply with the tax and for states to administer this. Um, it was created partly because states uh, back in the day were not allowed to levy sales tax on out-of-state businesses that were selling into the state. And one of the arguments that was made in the court decision that said states couldn't do that was it's too complicated to expect these out-of-state businesses to figure out the sales tax provisions in all of these different states. And so the streamlined sales tax agreement was designed to make that simpler. Um, the agreement does not dictate what we tax, but what it does say is if you're going to tax something, you have to use a standardized definition that the other states use. And so you can decide to tax something or not tax something, but under the agreement, if you tax it, you, you have to use um, the definition. And I'll note the agreement was successful. So um, a few years back, South Dakota versus Wayfair was a U.S. Supreme Court decision that overruled the previous decision and said that states could um, levy sales tax on out-of-state sellers that were selling into the state, and they did cite the streamlined sales tax agreement in that court case. Um, other ma uh, major taxes, so the property tax is an important tax. That's mostly local, not state. So there is a six mil statewide property tax that goes to the school aid fund. That raises about $2.3 billion of the $16.5 billion. Um, there's also a local school operating tax. We levy 18 mils on, on homestead property to help pay for schools. Um, and then it's, it's an, the most important funding source for our local government. So counties, cities, villages, townships, they get about $7 billion of the property tax. And then a whole variety of local entities get property tax as well. So intermediate school districts, community colleges, libraries, authorities, et cetera, um, the property tax is their primary funding source. Um, there are several constitutional restrictions on the property tax that restrict its growth. I'm going to talk about those a little more in a future slide. Um, personal property tax legislation, about 12 years ago, or 10 years ago, I guess, we passed legislation that began to phase out the personal property tax on manufacturing equipment. So personal property is, you can think of it as fixtures, machinery, equipment. If you're a business, your copy machine is personal property, your bumper press, if you're a car manufacturer, that's all personal property. That is all subject to the sales tax. I mean, I'm sorry, the property tax. In 2012, we began a 10-year phase out of, the, of eligible manufacturing um, personal property. Um, that phase out, we've run the 10 years, so it's fully exempt at this point. We also have an exemption for small businesses, so if your business is below a certain side, size, your personal property is um, fully exempt. Uh, local governments are reimbursed for that through the local community um, stabilization authority, um, and they get a portion of the 6% use tax to, to, that goes back to uh, um, local governments in a fairly complex way. So if you're interested in that, that would be a good topic for a, a future presentation and probably somebody, not me, that understands it better would be the right person to do that. I will note that last year we expanded um, the exemption on small businesses, but we have not yet enacted the legislation that reimburses local governments for that. We did have bills last year. They did pass the Senate unanimously. Um, they didn't make it through the House. So uh, we'd, we'd love to work with you in getting those bills in place and, and taking that next step. I mentioned a couple of uh, constitutional restrictions. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about two that are important to Michigan taxation. Uh, there's Headley and there's Proposal A. Um, you'll hear people use the term Headley pretty generically, but Headley actually refers to a whole bunch of different amendments to the Constitution um, that were all passed in 1978. So I'll, I'll go through them real 
quick. One is um, the state that state revenues are not allowed to exceed a certain percentage of state personal income. So that is you'll hear that referred to as the revenue limit. Um, if state revenues exceed that limit, it's they're either returned to taxpayers or deposited in the budget stabilization fund. Um, the state has exceeded this limit in the past, but we're billions of dollars away from the limit now, and I'll, I'll show that later. Um, new requirements to local governments. If the state puts a new requirement on a local government, they're required to support it um, with an appropriation that you'll hear that referred to as unfunded mandates. Um, there is uh, voter approval required to raise any local taxes. So if a local government wants to raise a property tax or raise an income tax, they're, they're required to have a vote of the people. And then there's a millage rollback where if taxable value uh, less new construction grows by faster than the rate of inflation, then the millage rate is rolled back so that property tax growth won't exceed the rate of inflation unit-wide. Um, we also have Proposal A, which was enacted in 1994, and the big one in Proposal A is on the individual parcel level, property tax growth um, is capped at 5% of the rate of inflation, whichever is less. And so those um, assessments are going in the mail right now. I got mine last week, and you'll see for a lot of people saw a 5% increase because the rate of inflation was over that, so we did hit the cap last year. Uh, other major taxes, and I'll talk about the corporate income tax a little more in later slides, um, but we have the corporate income tax, which is a 6% tax on C-corporations. Um, partnerships, limited liability companies, and similar pass-through entities are exempt from the CIT. Um, the CIT replaced the Michigan business tax, known as the MBT. We still have some taxpayers that are filing the MBT to claim old certificated credits, so it's still lurking, um, still lurking out there. Uh, and I will talk about those a little more on a future slide. Um, we have the gasoline tax, which is estimated to raise $1.2 billion in fiscal 23. It is currently 28.6 cents a gallon, and it is indexed for inflation, so that tax will go up um, every year. Um, I, these don't quite raise enough money to uh, rise to the level of major taxes, but I think they're relatively new, and so it's worth spending a minute talking about them. Um, we do have the marijuana tax. So adult use marijuana was legalized um, with uh, voter-initiated law one in 2018. That is a 10% tax on the excise price of marijuana. Um, it raised $194 million last year. It's expected to raise $222 million this year. That money goes to local governments, about 30%, 35% to the school aid fund, and then 35% to roads through the Michigan Transportation Fund. And I'll note that marijuana sales are also subject to the state's 6% sales tax. And then we have the gaming taxes. So we've, we've had taxes on the brick-and-mortar casinos in Detroit for a while. So there's three casinos in Detroit. Um, there is a 19% tax on adjusted gross wagering at those casinos. That tax revenue is split between the city of Detroit and the state. We also have 24 brick and mortar tribal casinos, uh, t roughly 12 of them, I think it's 12, pay compact payments to the state and to local governments. So they remit a small amount of money uh, on that front. Um, but more recently, uh, in 2019, legislation was passed to legalize sports betting and online gaming. So the sports betting rate is 8.4%, both for online sports betting and on-site sports betting. Um, that raises a relatively small amount of money, about $15 million, $4 million of which goes to the city of Detroit, um, and the remainder goes to the state. The iGaming, on the other hand, raises a significant amount of money. So the iGaming rates range from 20% to 28%, depending on your level of adjusted gross wagering. So if you're a bigger online gaming presence, you pay the higher tax rate. That's based on the volume of your sales. Um, iGaming raised $364 million last year. So that's a pretty significant amount of money, given how new that tax is. Um, $63 million of that went to the city of Detroit. $31 million of that went to tribes. Uh, 247 million of the remainder went to the school aid fund, and then roughly 23 million went went to other funds. Hey, I want to talk a little bit about some of the trends that we're seeing in Michigan taxation. So this slide shows um, Michigan taxes as a percent of personal income. So personal income, it's a measure the U.S. government puts out. You can think of it as a measure of the size of the state's economy. And this is what share of that ends up as state and local taxes. And um, we have been on sort of a steady downward trend through the years. So um, this chart goes back to 1977. You could see back in 77, we were at about 11%. Um, we peaked in the early 80s at about 11.5%, and then it's been um, a pretty steady decline since then. And in 2019, um, we hit basically a 40-year low where we were at 9% of, um, 
of state and local taxes. Now, I do want to note this chart only goes through 2019 because uh, that's the most recent good data I have from the source that publishes this. We did see substantial growth in taxes in fiscal year 21 and 22. So if I did have the data to extend this chart another couple of years, you would see the chart turn up a little bit. And I have a little more data on that from our own source um, in a couple of slides. So I think one of the big questions is going to be, okay, we're, we have this little hook up at the end of the chart, is to the extent of whether that's sort of a temporary pandemic-related increase in the level of taxation or if that is the start of some new trend. So, um, But looking at what that means for the state, um, this is similar data uh, for Michigan, um, but just in table form. And I, on the left, we've got state and local taxes per capita. And on the right, we have state and local taxes as a percent of personal income. And we've got Michigan in the US. And so I think if you look back at the late 70s, you could safely say that Michigan was a relatively high tax state. So in 1979, both per capita and as a percent of personal income, we were higher than the US average and we ranked in the top 10. So we were number nine on both of those measures. However, as I noted that we've sort of been on this steady glide path and that picture has changed somewhat. So in, 2000, in 1979, on a per capita basis, we raised 114% of what the average state raised. And in 2019, we raised just 79% of what the average state raised. And so our ranking on that measure has fallen from ninth to 35th. Now, some of, the, some of the shortfall on the per capita side is also related to economic growth. So we, slow, we grew slower than a lot of other states during that period, and so that also hurts us on the per capita side. But that's part of why we include taxes as a percent of personal income as well, to try to abstract from that. And in 1979, we, our state and local taxes as a percent of personal income were 10.9% compared to a U.S. average of 10%. And in 2019, we were at 9% compared to a U.S. average of 10%. So we were above the U.S. average, now we're below the U.S. average. So we've gone from 9th ranked to 33rd ranked. So a pretty significant change over that time period. Um, I mentioned the state revenue limit uh, before, and I, as I noted, the state revenue limit is a, it limits what share of the, um, personal income can go to taxes. It's just the state for this measure. It's not state and local. This is where we've been compared to the revenue limit through the years. It was enacted at the end of the 70s, and <coughs> we were below the limit right after it got enacted. And as that chart that I showed you was drifting down, we were sort of falling further and further below the revenue limit, and then we pop back up in the mid-90s. That pop-up is because we raised the sales tax from $0.04 cents to $0.06 cents as part of Proposal A. So that was a pretty meaningful change in state revenues, and we did not change the limit when we did that. So it made us a lot closer to the limit. So in 1995, we were just slightly above the limit. Um, 99 and 2000, we were just slightly above the limit. But since then, it's been a fairly steady trend down. Um, we peaked below the limit at $12 billion in fiscal year 2020. Now, as I noted, we've had very strong tax growth the last couple of years. And so you'll see in fiscal year 21, we're closer to $8 billion below the limit because of that strong growth. And I think you'll see something similar in fiscal 22 where that chart continues to go up a little bit. So just to illustrate that growth the last two years. So fiscal year 21, sales and use tax growth, 18% and 11% in 22. Similar story with the income tax, 12.8% and 17.6%. Corporate income tax grew 55% in 21 and 19% in 22. Part of why we missed the revenue estimates so far when we came into January was after that exceptionally strong growth in 21, we expected revenues to slow down a little bit. And as you can see, they continued to be really strong. And that was part of why the revenue estimates got raised so much. And you can also see I've included on this chart at the bottom, US CPIU, that's a measure of inflation. So inflation in fiscal year 21 was 3.3% and it was 7.9% in 22 and Michigan personal income. And so taxes the last two years have grown much faster um, than personal income or inflation. So it does raise the obvious question, what's going on, right? Why are taxes growing so much faster than they have in the past? Um, and there's several reasons we can point to, although I don't know that they fully explain the strength that we're seeing. So higher inflation certainly contributes to the growth. So um, when prices are higher, we get more from the sales tax. When wages are higher, we get more from the income tax. So that's certainly contributing. We've seen some consumption shifts during the pandemic. Um, from untaxed services towards taxable goods. So, for example, during the pandemic, you might not have bought Tiger tickets, you might have bought a TV, 
instead, right? And so the Tiger tickets would be tax exempt and the TV is taxable. And I think we saw that sort of repeated over and over again, right? You might buy patio furniture instead of going on vacation and uh, over and over and that, that contributed to, to sales tax growth. Um, we had the various pandemic relief measures that provided substantial resources to both businesses and individuals, um, and that led to increased consumption and to increased corporate profits, and that has translated into stronger tax growth. Uh, we've seen exceptionally strong corporate profits the last couple of years. That's also contributed to CIT growth. Um, I think the big question is, what's the permanence of this change? So some of the factors clearly seem transitory. Others seem like they might be here to stay. Um, and that is, but but the uncertainty there is creating uncertainty around the revenue outlook at the moment. You know, we, like I say, we we predicted we would go back to trend last year, and we really didn't, and so we ended up uh, dramatically underestimating revenues. We have a, con a fairly conservative revenue estimate again, so there is the possibility that revenues come in higher. But I'll note, given those strong growth rates we saw in the previous uh, slide, right, you go back to something closer to trend. There's also significant downside risk on those revenue estimates that we could fall short. We do have a number of longer term structural issues as part of why that chart was going down that we saw in the previous slides. Um, in particular, the share of the economy that's covered by the sales tax has been declining as consumers shift to untaxed services away from taxable goods. Um, we've seen that decline. Now, obviously during the pandemic, as I just said, we went the other way. People went back towards taxable goods. So we'll see how permanent or temporary that is. Um, we have constitutional and property tax restrictions that I mentioned in Headley and Proposal A. Those keep the property tax from growing as fast as the economy. And they did also limit our recovery from the Great Recession. We also have very strict limits on the taxes that local governments can levy. And so that, and, and basically, um, they primarily uh, rely on the property tax, and the property tax does not grow as fast as the economy. So that, that's one of the issues as well. And then as I noted, we had very slow economic growth for 10 years between about 2001 and about 2010, and that had a big impact on our level of taxation as well. Just to illustrate what I meant about the sales tax, so the brown bars here are personal consumption expenditures. It, it's a technical term, but basically it's just like how much is, are people spending on stuff? Like what, what are they spending? And then the green line is what share of that is covered by the sales tax. And if you go back to 1997, about two thirds of what consumers were purchased was covered by the sales tax. And if you go out to 2020, it's about half of what consumers purchase is covered by the sales tax. And so as consumption is continually shifting away, we see the sales tax not keeping up with overall economic growth. Of course, we have done significant tax cutting over the last 20 years as well. That's contributing to that trend also. Um, when we replaced um, the Michigan business tax with the corporate income tax, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute, that ended up being a net $500 million tax cut after the personal income tax increases were factored in. We repealed the personal property tax on eligible manufacturing property. That was another $500 million. Um, we have the mega tax credits that are left over from the old MBT. That's another $500 million. Um, we repealed the driver's responsibility fees. That's $85 million. We had something called sales tax on the difference, which lowered the sales tax when you buy a new car when you trade one in. That was another $50 million. And then if you get to smaller tax cuts, it's just an extensive list that goes on and on. So we, ha we have done quite a bit of tax cutting through the, through the last several years. Okay, I'm going to finish with a little bit about the MBT to CIT transition because we get a lot of questions on that, and I think it would be useful to talk about. So Michigan used to have something called a single business tax, which was a, which was a, a value-added type tax that was relatively unique. We repealed that in 2008, and we replaced it with something called the Michigan business tax. Um, that was a modified uh, – I'm sorry. That was a 4.95% tax on business income and a tax on modified gross receipts of 0.8%. The philosophy behind the MBT was to have a really high tax base and then to offset it with credits. And those credits were designed to do two things. They were designed to export the tax to businesses that were out of state and to incent certain activities that we thought were desirable in Michigan, like employing Michigan residents or investing in Michigan. So the MBT had 30 credits. So it was very complicated, but there was like method to the madness. That's why it had all those credits was because it was a really high tax and then we were trying to incense stuff. But at the same time, um, the MBT was very unpopular. I think you could say it was just, it was unique among the states. No other states had it. It was complicated to figure out um, and it ended up getting repealed. Um, the MBT was replaced with a 6% corporate income tax in 2012. So the CIT is far simpler than the MBT was, but it also raises far less revenue. So CIT doesn't have any credits, but it, it also doesn't have the revenue raising capacity. And I'll show that in the next slide. So this slide shows what we collected in the, the single business tax in 2000 
what we collected in the MBT, and there was a little bit of legacy SBT in there in 2011, and then what we collected last year uh, roughly um, in the corporate income tax and the legacy MBT credits. And these numbers are not adjusted for inflation. So you can see in 2000, the single business tax raised $2.3 billion. And the CIT MBT um, for last year only raised $1.5 billion. So <coughs> the primary business tax in Michigan is raising significantly less than it did 20 years ago right now. And then you can see that in some other statistics. Um, these are some data that's put out by the Council of State Taxation. Uh, on the left, it's the share of state and local taxes in Michigan that are paid by businesses. And in 2010, it was about 39%. And in 2021, it was 35%. And that was uh, primarily because we lowered business taxes and we replaced a significant portion of the revenue with the income tax, the individual income tax. And then on the right, it's business taxes as a share of state private domestic pro gross domestic product. So what that measure is, is gross domestic product is the whole economy. Private gross domestic pr uh, um, product is the whole economy without government. So it's like the private sector. In 2010, um, business taxes, state and local business taxes, were 4.6% of that overall economy. <coughs> Excuse me. In 2021, it was 3.7%. So that's actually a pretty dramatic decline, and it puts us at the second lowest among states after North Carolina. So with that, I will stop, and I know that's a lot that I went through pretty quickly there. So I'll be happy to answer any questions or to go back and um, talk about a slide that I went through too quickly and provide more information. Okay. Well, we want to thank you, Mr. Gully, for just uh, coming and giving us the presentation, giving us a little more history on our taxes. Um, I know it helped me out a lot, and I hope it helped um, our colleagues out a lot. I do have one question, and then we do have some other um, colleagues here that would like to ask questions. My first one would, could you speak to which tax in our current structure are regressive in nature? I am, um, so I think we've got a few that are regressive in nature. So um, regressive, you know, means that it's, uh, it places a disproportionate uh, burden on lower, uh, lower income taxpayers. So, um, you know, the tobacco tax is certainly uh, one that I think is fairly regressive in nature. I think uh, you do have a higher prevalence of smoking among lower income taxpayers. Um, the gasoline tax is another one that, you know, has a little bit of that feature. And then um, the sales tax would be another one. I don't think the sales tax is as regressive um, as those other taxes, but you do, uh, people who are lower income do spend a higher proportion of their income. And so more of their income ends up being subjected to the sales tax, which I think some people would argue makes it a somewhat regressive tax. Thank you so much. <coughs> now we hear from um, Rep. Ogden. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for being here today. Uh, a couple simple questions for you. My first one is, what, what services do we tax here in Michigan? So I, I can provide, I'll have to get the list that the Federation of Tax Administrators has, but I mean, a few that come to mind are uh, leases, rentals. So like if you rent a snowblower or like a post digger um, or you, you, know, you rent a car, those are all subject to the use tax. Um, if you stay in a hotel, that's subject to the use tax. Um, and then there are some things that are maybe in a gray area, like phone calls are subject to the use tax as a phone call service. I mean, so, there, so there's that question as well. But like I say, the FDA has identified 20 of them. So I can, we can pull that list and send you the list of 20. 20 in Michigan? Yes. Wow. Why do we uh, tax a very limited amount of services? I, what, was, what was kind of the idea behind that? Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know if there was um, a specific idea behind why we, why we tax services or don't tax services. We do traditionally tax very few of them compared to other states. I mean, there are states that tax a lot of things that are not subject to the tax in Michigan. Yeah. I'm just curious. I mean, we, we don't have a service tax here in Michigan, but yet yeah, we tax a limited amount of things so just kind of a weird uh, so idea. I mean service tax is I think a, a generic term right I mean so health care and like child care services in very few states tax those right uh -huh. uh, I think that when you look at individual services what you see is sort of a wide range of what's picked up and what's not picked up like do they pick up rental cars do they pick up hotels are they taxing repair are they taxing I mean so there, there's a wide range of services, we we do tax very few of them. Um, we did add a bunch of services to the sales tax in 2007 that were subsequently repealed before it went into place when we were 
enacting the Michigan business tax. So there have there have been, you know, people have looked at this question before, but but traditionally you, you are correct. We tax very few. Okay. Interesting. Uh, my my second question is and um Maybe this might require a follow-up from you or your office, but could you maybe explain the, the mega tax credits a little bit? I mean, these these, these were over 20 <coughs> years ago, and here we are still talking about them, and I just want to get a little more information on that. Sure. So the the mega tax credits were economic development credits, and they're, they're what were referred to as certificated credits. And basically what the certificated credit means is that they were awarded to the company. So there wasn't like a credit that just anybody that everybody got you had to have them awarded they were awarded for um the 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 proposal so the mega um started i think late in the angler administration and they were originally designed to attract manufacturing to michigan so they were a credit if you were creating new jobs in the state of michigan you could get a mega credit and what the mega credit was was originally a refund for income tax withholding that you paid or single business tax that you paid. And the argument on the mega credit when they were first put in place was that, well, we wouldn't have got that revenue if we didn't get the new factory put in so that the budget impact was limited uh, from it. That, that was the original inclination of that. As the years went on, the mega credit expanded. So uh, more and more activities were covered by the mega credit as they were state was trying to attract additional economic development activity, um, including mega credits instead of creating new jobs in the state for retaining new jobs in the state. And so I think the bulk of the credits that we have now that we're still paying on were retention credits designed to keep manufacturing jobs in the state. Those credits were put in place in the Great Recession, which you may remember was a grim time here. Um, and so they were put in place. They are significant in value. I mean, $500 million a year is significant in value. They are smaller than they used to be because companies can continue to file under the MBT while they continue to get their certificated credits. And once those credits expire, then they go to the CIT. I think we have a couple dozen firms that are still getting the- Is there any the cutoff? For for uh, businesses that you know continue to file under the yes MBT. there is and um, we have a report that we submit to the legislature that we can send you that has um, a little bit of the history of the mega credits and it has the projected credit payments going forward and when those credits expire yeah please send that to me that'd yeah. be that'd be fantastic um, yep. thank you for your time yeah uh, next question would come from uh, uh, Vice Chair Ben Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. I've got more of a, a nuts and bolts question. Um, so as the state accountant, are you required to follow the generally accepted accounting practices gap? And has there ever been cases where you haven't followed those? Or do you see that? Uh, have you ever had um, where you see that you wouldn't have to follow those? Or have you changed that in the past? Um, so we're actually not the state's accountants, right? So I'm an economist. The state's accountants are in management and budget in the state budget office. Um, the state is, though, I mean, I do I mean the state is generally gap compliant. Has the state always been gap compliant? I don't think the state was gap compliant in the early 80s. But um, I mean, that's a bit of a history test, so I could be wrong on that. But I do think there was a brief period in that recession when the state fell out of gap compliance. But yes, generally the state is gap compliance. If, compliant. if we're not in gap compliance, what happens to the state? Does that affect the bond rating? So yeah, I mean, if, you, if the state were not gap compliant, right, that would be a negative. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have um, Rep. Brixey. Thank you, uh, Chair Neely. Um, and thanks for the presentation. It takes some special folks to get all excited about this topic, and <laughs> I, I'm one of those real big nerds here. <laughs> um, so my question is kind of involving several of your slides. Uh, the first one was the, um, the slide where you showed Michigan being a high-tax state but now a low-tax state. Okay, thank you. So when I was looking at this, I was wondering, um, is that simply um, the uh, sales tax and the property taxes per capita? So I don't think so. I mean, it, I think it warrants more in-depth study is, is really like, why is it not growing with the economy? I mean, that's certainly part of it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean. No, 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 you're I'm misunderstanding sorry. my I'm question. Sorry. Yeah. 
the way that you're calculating this per capita SNL tax. Oh, I'm so sorry. Is that sales tax and property tax? No, I'm sorry. Let me let me yeah, let me restate okay. what it is. Um, so it is state and local taxes. So it's all state and local taxes. And so it's in, it's, it's not everything. just personal income. It's everything. It's everything. Okay, thank you. So now that's what I thought it was, but I was confused by those letters. What that meant. Yep, my apologies. Um, so when we look at that, we see that in the 70s we were you know ranked ninth in um, uh, in the nation in tax rate um, and then we've dropped down to 33rd uh, but the pie shaped graph that you showed us where you showed what percentage of our budget is coming from the different taxes can you put that one up again Yes. Although I'll note that one, this is state and local, and the pie was I just know. state. Okay. I know. And I don't know why my slides are doing that. Sorry. This one? Okay. So this one, I would have loved to seen this slide from the 70s, the 80s, or the 90s, because my guess is that that. Uh, MBT, CIT, 1.2 billion, 3% was a lot larger piece of the pie than it is today. Is that fair? I mean, I, I would hate to speculate without doing it, but we can pull the data from the, we, I mean, we, we can pull the census, this, that census data, we can pull it and answer that question for you. We can make that pie chart. Um, the definitions the census uses are not exactly in line with ours, but we can use their definitions and make a pie chart that looks similar to this using census data for 1979 and for 2019. Because that graph that you showed the level of taxes on Michigan businesses has declined, and you show um, 2010 to 2021, and you have percents. You don't have flat dollar amounts. Um, I, I don't suppose you'd know what those dollar amounts I, would be. From. I'll have to look and see if it's in the report. So we use something called the Council of State Taxation publishes a report on state business taxes. It's Ernst & Young is uh, the firm that, that mm -hmm. does that. Um, and I'll have to see if they have dollars in there. It is a complicated calculation they do because I think they are trying to also include in that calculation individual income tax paid on pass-through business entities. So if you're a lawyer at a law firm, mm -hmm. right, and your partnership is paying tax, that they try to build that in. So I, but I think they have the dollars in there. I can pull those. So, you know, looking at the way that we've changed the tax policies, it, it seems to me, um, especially from that um, bar graph that showed the business taxes as a share of state and local taxes, that, um, that we've shifted, we've seen a shift in the tax burden away from businesses in the 70s and onto the backs of individuals um, since uh, 2010 um, and so you may be right I mean we have to look at it certainly the tax changes we made in 2012 um, right was a shift we I mean we replaced the the revenue from lowering the business taxes by increasing the individual income tax yep. so I mean so that was a shift there I'll admit what you know our structure in the 70s I got to look that up I can't I can't answer that off the top of my head okay so um, you know, the, the, there appears to me to still be kind of a structural deficit that we have, and that's why we see our infrastructure declining, because when you look at are we keeping up with inflation or not, in terms of revenue to provide the services like fixing the roads and other services that we provide, um, we're not we're so far under that Headley cap that that's a good indicator of kind of how far below um, inflation we are and, um, you know, how, how are we going to shape our tax policies to account for that and to um, generate the revenue we need to do the things that we value. Really? 
Thank, <laughs> Thank you, um, Rep. Brooksy. Next, we have uh, Rep. Carter. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for your testimony. I'm going back to state and local, particularly local. Which Michigan cities are subjected to income taxation and why? So we have, I don't remember what the number from the slide was, 23 um, cities. It's, it's a little bit of a hodgepodge of cities. So some of our Bigger cities have the income tax, and I'm gonna. I, I don't know all of them, but okay. you know, certainly, Detroit, Grand Rapids have a city income tax. I think Highland Park has one. Pontiac. Pontiac, Flint has an income tax, <clears throat> and so they they are some of our older legacy manufacturing cities. I think tend tend to have the income tax, and then there's like a handful of ones like I think Albion is on that list. East Lansing has an income tax. There, there's occasionally, uh, right, sometimes if it, you have a place that has like a dominant employer where a lot of the people working there don't live in in the community, you end up with the income tax. I think that was a little bit of the rationale that East Lansing had when East Lansing, you know, uh, passed its income tax. But yeah, it, it does tend to be our older core cities that have the income tax. And the reason being that they're older or they're manufacturing, how are these 23 cities picked? Uh, is it by the city? It's by the city, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Rep. Carter. Next, we have Rep. Price. Yes, thank you, Chair Neely, and thank you for the presentation. Your slide about um, Headley and Prop A, I'm, I'm glad that you explained a little bit about each of those to us. Um, coming from a municipal background, being very familiar with um, how these sometimes create constraints on our ability to fund municipal projects, I was wondering if you could share a little bit about the, the conflicts between these two and, and how they interact with each other. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, so I'm assuming you, you mean the taxable value cap and the rollback provisions. So, <clears throat> so the Headley rollback provision is unit-wide. So if your property taxes unit-wide or would grow by the rate of inflation, um, the millage rate is automatically reduced, um, with the exception that new construction is not counted in that calculation. So that calculation tends to be more difficult for sort of built-out communities, older core communities, as opposed to communities that have still have a lot of new construction going on. Um, and then the taxable value cap is on individual parcels until the parcels are sold. And again, if you are in a community where the parcels aren't turning over a lot, that, that can be a real constraint as well. Um, I think there's two things that, uh, ways they impact local governments. One is... By capping it at inflation, right, you're not growing often as fast as the economy as a whole. So that that puts sort of ongoing um, pressure on communities. But the other is sort of the one direction that they work in, so that if you do find yourself in a situation where you see an actual decline in values, like we saw in 2008, um, the base resets at a lower level and then it's capped at inflation again. So it's very difficult for communities to recover if they see a significant decline in their values. And... <coughs> particularly in 2008, we had a number of communities, especially in Southeast Michigan, that saw some fairly dramatic property tax declines. And I think that um, Headley and Proposal A did create significant challenges in those communities. Thank you. And we just want to thank you for um, coming in again and giving us a history of this. And we had a lot of good questions. And so I'm so happy that, you know, you came out and to be with us today. So thank uh, you so much. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And we really uh, look forward to working with all of you. So if we can be a resource, please reach out to us. I'm just going to introduce Amanda West sitting behind me is our new legislative affairs director. So she can help with any issues you have. And and we, we look to be a resource. So All thank right. you again. Thank you so much. And it was nice meeting you. All right. Now we need a motion to excuse any absent members that we may have. So uh, Representative Van Welcome had made the motion to excuse our absent members. Without any objections of absent members are excused. There being no further business before this committee, this committee stands adjourned.